Brother Ismail Ibn Ali. Uh, he's working on setting up right now. Um, just a little bit about him. He's the Deputy Executive Director. That is a nice title to have, mashallah, at uh, Fawaki Institute and serves as an instructor of uh, Quranic Arabic. He holds a bachelor's in science of science in biochemistry from the University of Florida, mashallah, and a master's of science and education with concentration in urban education from John Hopkins University, mashallah. Uh, while at John, Johns Hopkins, Ismail was a full-time high school chemistry teacher uh, chemistry and technology teacher at uh, Connection School for the Arts in Baltimore City Public School System. Uh, Ismail is a graduate of Fawaki 2010. Uh, he's a graduate there and um, he's continued studying Arabic uh, from Fawaki teachers and mentors. Uh, and I can honestly tell you guys he has a love uh, for the Arabic language, for the words, for the linguistics. And so today he'll be sharing a little bit of that with us. Um, for a very timely topic, uh, the linguistics and vocabulary of Ramadan. So, uh, as you all know, Ramadan is right around the corner. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, wa ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma akhrijna min dhulumat al wahm, wa akrimna bi nuri fahm. Allahumma aftah alayna abwaab rahmatik, wa anshur alayna khazaina ulumik. Birahmatika ya arhamar rahimin, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathiran kathira. Uh, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you all this Saturday morning. May Allah reward you for coming to the masjid on your Saturday morning and inshallah trying to attain some knowledge. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, He grants people, if He loves them, He grants them knowledge of the deen. So the fact that you're here and the fact that you came to inshallah acquire some of that knowledge means that inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. And that's an important thing. So uh, I'm a teacher by trade. Uh, so you guys are way too spaced out for me. Um, the sisters are pretty much in one group. I like that. The brothers of you guys are way too spaced. So you got to come forward. And this is going to be a very interactive session. Uh, I'm a teacher in theory, but in reality by teaching the Arabic language, I've only become more and more of a student. And some of my students are in the audience and they can attest to the fact that when we're in class, you know, we're kind of just having a conversation. So I'm going to present to you some ideas. Uh, they're not mine. Well, some of them are mine. I'll tell you when they're mine and when they're not. And, uh, and then inshallah, based upon that, we can have a discussion about what we're going to talk about today, which is ulum lughat al-Qur'an, uh, lughat al-Ramadan which is just a fancy way of saying the linguistics of Ramadan, which is a fancy way of saying the words that you might say in Ramadan. <laughs> okay? And uh, I work for the Fawaki Institute, and that's the only reason why I've come to know some of this, is because of studying through there. And uh, some of you, I'm not a native Arab speaker, so if you are native or you have learned this before, feel free to jump in and give your opinion. Uh, this is again meant to be an interactive session. So, Bismillah. And I just want to make sure, can everyone see? If you can't, then try to move yourself so that you can do that, inshallah. Okay, so before we can talk about words in the Arabic language, we have to look at what are called the roots of Arabic words. And to get this idea around what that could be, I need you to think about mathematics for a second. Okay? So how many of you, I see some young, younger students in here, how many of you have done geometry? If you're already in college, you don't have to answer that question. Okay, so some of the younger kids have done geometry, right? So there's this thing in geometry called the Cartesian coordinate system. Cartesian coordinate system, right? And for coordinates, there are three coordinates, right? And they are what? What do we call them? The first coordinate is the, you guys can all shout it, one, two, three. The first coordinate. The first coordinate is the X coordinate, right? Then we have after that the? And then finally the? Z coordinate, right? X horizontal, Y vertical, and then Z being dimensional. It gives you 3D, right? So there are three variables that you normally use in geometry, X, Y, and Z. All right, and have my Cartesian plane here. X, Y, and Z. Are we cool with that? You understand what I'm talking about here? 
these are variables, right? So if you have any number, uh, if, sorry, if you have any point in that plane or in that uh, three-dimensional space, it has an x coordinate, it has a y coordinate, and it has a z coordinate. You didn't think you'd come to learn math, right? Well, here you go. Now, Arabic language is the same exact way. Okay? Arabic words have their own coordinates. And these coordinates, we call them Fa'ul Kalima, the Fa letter. Fa, you can think about it, represents X. You have the Ainul Kalima, which is the Ain letter. And you have Lamul Kalima, which is the Lam letter. So every word, more, you know, 99% of the time, I don't like to say every with Arabic, because Allah will just throw you some stuff, you're just like, I don't know what this is, but I kind of try to figure it out. So you have for almost every single word in Arabic, fa, wa ain, wa lam, ul kalima. So for example, and in that order. So for example, if I take the letter kaf, and then I put the letter ta next to it, and the letter ba in that order, any word that has those three letters will have something to do with what? Who knows? Writing. With writing, right? So, as an example, we have the word katibun. Ma ma'na katib? Katib means a writer. Then you have kitabun, which means, a, everyone should know this one, a book. Then you have the word maktab. Right? And what does maktab mean? A what? A library. Okay, that's maktaba. Maktab, office or a desk. Because maktab is on the pattern of what we call ism makan. It's the place where you do something. Yani, so you can write in an office or you can write on a desk. And so if you look, you can't really see too well because of the lighting. But sometimes you have extra letters. So here the alif is extra. This elef is extra, this meme is extra. But they all still have kaf, ta, wa ba in that tabtib, in that same exact order. With that in mind, let's jump into and look at some of the words that you might hear in the month of Ramadan. And with the short amount of time, I had to pick only a few. You could do this all day, okay? Bismillah. The first one is obviously Ramadan. Right, we're in this, we're about to inshallah, Allah allows us to reach it, the month of Ramadan. So if I use that same logic, and I need to identify my fa ul kalima, kalima means word, wa ain ul kalima, wa lam ul kalima, what would be my first coordinate, you could say, my first variable? Fa, uh, fa which in this case is ra. What would be the second one? Meem. And the last one would be? Bad. Good. If you didn't know that, you'll come to know that Alif and Noon at the end, a lot of times are extra. So, Ra, Ma, Ba. Anyone know what that root means? So we know Ramadan means the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. But what does Ra, Ma, Ba mean? It means to scorch or to burn normally from the sun. So you could say, for example, the Arabs could say, Ramalat al-Ard. The earth became vehemently heated. It became scorched by the sun. Ramalat al-Ard. The earth became vehemently heated. It became scorched by the sun. Now you're okay, okay, whoa, what's going on? How does the word for the month of the <laughs> Ramadan which has to do with fasting, have to do with being scorched, right? So, what are some of your thoughts? What, what could be the connection? What could be the link? It's a, it's a month of cleansing. It's a month of cleansing, he says. Okay, cleansing is not in this definition. When you heat something, like when you heat something it's a purification process. I like that. You burn calories while you're fasting. You burn calories while you're fasting. I like that. What else? From the sister's side, any ideas? This is not, I don't have the right answer. I'm just taking your ideas. Burning the original. Burning the? Sins. Sin. I like that one. You were going to say the same thing. Barakallahu feekuma. Right? Also, the names that we have for the months were not the names that the Arabs used to use before Islam came into being. 
and I actually don't remember the name of Ramadan before, Ramadan, before the Islamic calendar, but when the conversion came of the different names of the months, they would use, they would call the months by the season that they were in. So when the conversion happened, Ramadan fell in the hotter part of the year. So they called it Ramadan because it was at a time when the sun was hot. So you can take it both ways, but both ways give you a much more, you know, better understanding of what the word really means. It's not just, oh, some month in the lunar calendar. It's a lot more than that. And that's the idea here. If you get anything from today's short talk, is that Arabic words and the Arabic language is much more than just letters put together. We believe that it's tawqifiyah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose every single letter to have a specific meaning. To have a specific meaning. And that's a whole science. It's in PhD Arabic students go through the meaning of every single individual letter. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, with this idea of Ramadat al Arud, it takes us to the next word, which is Saum. A Saum. And what does Saum get translated to? Fasting. Now, use the same XYZ. What are our root letters here? What's the first one? Saad. What's the second one? Wow. And Lamul Kalima? Meem. Excellent. And so this means generally to abstain, to fast. That's what fasting means. You leave something. Right? So you abstain from eating. You abstain if you smoke cigarettes and you abstain from that. Right? And you abstain from different things. And then when you come to do iftar, you break that fast. Okay? So Allah says, or you could say, for example, in another context, Sama anis sayl, meaning that he abstained from traveling. That's how you can use the word. It doesn't just mean to fast, it means to abstain. You can abstain from many things, from talking, from whatever. Okay, Sama anis sayl, he abstained from journeying, he abstained from traveling. Okay, now let's check this out. So again, we're looking at how did the Arabs use these words and how do they come to have the meaning that they have now? So the Arabs, with this word, they would say, Samat al shams Samat al shams Now, if you didn't know the actual meaning of Sama, Yasumu, how would you translate this? If you know Arabic, right? al shamsu is marfu'un, huwa fa'il. So the sun is, or the sun has fasted. Does that make any sense? No. Another example, it can be said, Sama, oh, I, oh, I gave it away already. Alright, oh, let's do it. Sama to Shams is what the Arabs would call it right before Zawal. You guys know what Zawal is? So when you have to, when you have to figure out what time Dhuhr is, right? Dhuhr is supposed to be after when the sun is at its highest point in the sky because there's no shadow then. So the time after that is called Ba'da Zawal is when you can pray Dhuhr. Samat al shams is when the sun is at its highest point in the sky. Okay, so just keep that in mind for a second. Then I'll translate that in a little bit. So we, do, ignore that meaning for now. The other example is Sama al ma Sama al ma What's al ma Water. So if you didn't know what Sama meant, it would mean that the water fasted. Again, this doesn't make any sense. Sam al ma means the water became motionless. It was very still. And if you think about it, when is the sun still? When is the sun still if you were to look at it? It can only be still at the highest point. After that, it's either moving, right? When, it, when else is it still? It's either going up, and rising, or it's setting. But there's one point when it's still, and that's when there's no shadow. Samat al shams So, with that in mind, we have the meaning of Sama Yasumu to include being at your highest point. We have it to mean being still, to be motionless. So now how might that affect our understanding of the word Saum for Ramadan? How, how can that play into my understanding of that? What might you think? Good. First of all, is when you fast, it's kind of difficult to do a lot of things. So you yourself probably go take a Qailula and just sleep somewhere. 
highest spiritual. Exactly. MashaAllah, Obi. You're at your highest spiritual point in Ramadan. Right? When else do you feel that kind of high throughout the rest of the year? Very little for the majority of us. But in Ramadan is when we truly experience that height, and that spiritual height, and that closest to Allah Azza wa Jal. That happens through Salma Yasumu. And, and Salm is the only deed for Allah that only is between you and Allah, in theory. Right? Because you could pray in the masjid and someone could see you pray. You could be giving sadaqah and someone sees that sadaqah. But for some, unless I tell you, or you come close enough to smell my breath, right? Then you don't really know that I'm fasting or not. That's between you and Allah, and that's why Allah rewards it so much. That's why His reward for that is with Him alone. Only He knows how much you get rewarded for, for your soul. Samat as shams Okay? Good. We have two words down. Next word. In, inshallah, in this month of Ramadan, we try to increase our ibadah, our worship of Allah. And one of the ways to worship Him is through salah. Now this is a little bit tricky. Alright? The first fa letter will be what? Sa'ad. What's the lam, uh, the ayn letter? Lam. What is the lam letter? Not tamal buta. So you'll come to learn that Arabic has weak letters, right? Weak consonants. And they are alif, waw, wa ya. And here the, the majority opinion is that it's sa'ad, lam, waw. Okay, that's a whole other discussion. But normally we use salawa, salawat for example. To mean to pray or to worship. To mean to pray or to worship. Okay? So Allah says in the Quran, Wasta'inu bi sabri was salah. Wasta'inu bi sabri was salah in Surah Al-Baqarah. I think Ayah 41. Right? Where it says he's saying, seek help through patience and prayer. So I'm just showing you how Allah uses the word salah in the Quran. Right? We understand that so far. Now let's look at how the word is used in the language. Okay? You can say, for example, salautuhu. Salautuhu. What, what might that mean? Anyone know? Any Arab know? If I say salautuhu? It doesn't mean I, I worship him. No. I can see where you came up with that idea though. Salautuhu means that I struck or beat him. Salautuhu means I hit him. Yani <laughs> darb. Meaning to hit. Now, here's another word, and let's try to figure out the connection. So what you do with all this, you go to a dictionary, and you look this up, and you say, now how does all this relate? This word, salan, it means the middle of a back of a quadruped. The middle of the back of a human, or any four-legged animal. <laughs> You're like, what is this guy doing up here, man? <laughs> what is he talking about? Okay, look, so think about it. We have salah, which is prayer. Then we have the meaning of to beat or to strike. Then we also have the meaning of the back of an animal, the back of a human. So how are we to understand the word salah? What are some ideas? I told you you got to think this morning. Huh? Like when someone beats you, you like heal over, so like salah, you're going... I like that. You get beat hard enough, you're going to end up making that motion. Good. Again, I'm not here to say whether it's right or wrong. You will take your own meanings from this as you think about it deeply. I like that. That's a good one. What else? What's your definition? Huh? What's your definition? How would you define it? Oh, how would I define Oh, I'm going to give you my thought on it right after. But I need, some, I need some audience participation. I see someone pointing at someone back there in the pink hijab. Hey, Salaamu what is your, what do you, what do you think? Um, if you don't pray, you'll get V on your back. <laughs> well, I hope that's not how your parents discipline you to make sure that you pray. I like that, an analogy for an act of submission. Right, ultimately when you, you can submit many ways. You can submit by force, or you can submit willingly. It's Islam, you, submit, you willingly submit, and then what's the motion that you make? Right, you make this prostrating motion. 
Okay. The way I kind of thought of it, and again, you can disagree with me, is that if you think about if, if the word for worship has to do with striking, okay, ultimately our worship is supposed to do what? Draws us closer to Allah, and it is a way of taking us away from what or from who? Shaitan is, yeah, that's an important one. <laughs> Prayer is a guard against shaitan. Prayer is a guard against shaitan. You know? Prayer is a guard against him. So if you want to really beat shaitan a good beating, pray. Right? Also, if you look at the idea of salah meaning to do with the back, our back is what makes us who we are as human. And the fact that we can stand that way. Right? And now, have you ever thought of, what's the word for the first human? He was the first prophet. Adam, right? You ever look at the word Adam? Like, ever just look at it? I'm, I'm not making this up. Okay, look. Adam. What motion in prayer does Adam look, the Aleph look like? Yeah, standing. Yeah, standing. Now, what's the next letter in Adam? Dad. Dad. What does that look like? Just if I turn it a little bit. <laughs> what is that? Huh? You going, you going, you going with me? Ruku'a. Now, what's the last letter? Meme. If I turn that baby around, <laughs> what do I get? You get such a... Is it any coincidence that the word for human, the first human, has the motions of salah in it? This is not me, but this is Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. Well, he's probably the greatest of scholars today in the English language. I mean, you can't, you can't make this up, that, this, that the language is like this. It's part of our nature as human beings to be people who do that. Who stand and prostrate and uh, and bow and prostrate? It's part of who we are, and salah is an integral part of us. Just like our back is an integral part of our ability to be a human being and to walk around and do what we need to do. <coughs> My idea. Okay, few more. Inshallah, in our salah, we receive a question. Yeah, Salah, that's a very good point. So she said, what was your name? Um, Arabic. Nah, whichever you prefer. Ola. Mashallah. So she said that uh, Salah also has the meaning of Sila, which is another strong opinion. And Sila is a connection. A connection, like when you call somebody, it has Sila. Right? So Salah is a connection that you establish. I say so, I've heard some people say, you know, instead of sending an email, send a knee mail. Come on, you guys don't think that's funny? <laughs> instead of sending an email, send a knee mail to Allah Azza wa Jal. It might it'll get answered. He will automatically answer you. And someone who sends an email, they won't necessarily answer you. Allah will answer you though. Okay? I like that. Barakallah. So in our salah we recite what from the Quran al Kareem? And from Qur'an, what are the root letters for Qur'an? We get here, the first letter would be Qaf And the second one? Ra And the last one? No, not Alif Hamza Hamza, very good Okay Now Qara'a Qara'a, the verb, means to recite Right? If this will go did you just die? Okay, I guess it died. Qara'a means to recite. Okay, I got it now. To recite. Allah says in the Quran, Inna Quran al Fajri kana mashhuda. And I brought this ayah because it says, indeed, the Quran of Fajr, right, is witnessed. What does he mean here, Allah subhanahu wa by Quran? He means salah. So he's equating Quran with salah. Okay, now with that idea in mind, right, this is, uh, this is good because Allah is saying that we witness you praying Fajr. So pray Fajr, <laughs> right? So the Quran of Fajr is witnessed. 
Now, qaf, ra, hamza. Qaf, ra, hamza. From that, the Arabs can say qara ash shay. Qara ash shay. What does that mean? Qara ash shay. Anyone know what shay means? A thing. So, does this mean he recited a thing? What do you think? Ah. Uh -huh. Okay. Qara ash shay. That means he collected something. Qara'a ashay means he collected together the thing. Okay, he collected together the thing. And Quran, what do we know Quran to generally mean? This is not a trick question. The what? The book of Allah, but why is it called that? Why, if Qara'a, if the verb means to recite, then Qur'an will mean what? Good. Well, she got to where I was going with that. Very good. So she said the Qur'an was revealed in many different points in time and it was all ultimately what? Collected together. So it's a collection of all the revelation. It's also a collection of ayat. It's a collection of the ahkam of Allah. It's a collection of all the qasas, all the stories from the Qur'an. So the Qur'an is a collection, but at the same time, it's also Qur'an in that it is a recitation, it is a recital. And that's what makes uh, Ramadan so special for a lot of us, is we get to go to the masjid and we get to hear the recitation of the Qur'an from people who have learned it and memorized it and imprinted it in their heart. They may need some, murad, they may need some practice, but it's there, right? To go and hear the Qur'an being recited every single night, juz after juz. And it's a collection of all those stories. So now when you go and you stand in Tarawih, see if you can figure out what are the story that's, what story is being talked about. What is being talked about in this uh, juz that we're going to recite. If you do that little bit of homework, I guarantee you your, your Ramadan will be transformed. It will be transformed. Okay? Now, the first surah of the Qur'an is Al-Fatiha. Is Al-Fatiha. Okay, what are the root letters here? We have Fa. What's next? Ta. And what's last? Ha. Good. Now what does that mean? To open. To open. For example, a miftah is a key. Right? So uh, we say, I said in the beginning, Allahumma iftah alayna abwaaba rahmatik. Oh Allah, open for us your doors of mercy. Open for us doors of your mercy. You can do it either way. Now, what does the word Al-Fatiha mean? She says opening. What else could it mean? Just the word Fatiha, not the other names of Al-Fatiha. There are many other names. So that means you're Mia. I'm thinking, look. What else? So she said opening, I like that. That's a good one. That's better than what most people do. Opener. You're very close though. It's not opening. Opening is the masdar in Arabic. It's the, it's the gerund, like running, or hiking, or biking, or riding. Fatiha is not that. He says opener. Very good. He says opener. Start. Okay, that's a good guess. I appreciate you for saying that. A lot of people say, a lot of times when I ask this question, they say Fatiha is the beginning. Because they think it's the beginning of the Quran. But we'll see if that's true or not in a second. Alright, so we have Fatiha is the opener. We'll go with that one and I'll we'll explain that's why in a second. In order to figure out what this really means, we have to go to another word and then come back to this. Is that okay? You guys good? You can nod, make me feel like I'm doing something. Uh, you guys are not nodding. Let me see some nodding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good, Teek. Okay. The next word, and this is, there's only two left. The next word is Taraweeh. Now, what does Taraweeh? What are the root letters of Taraweeh? What's the first one? Ra. Very good. He didn't fall for the trick. Ra. Wow. You should say Aleph, and I heard wow. Wow is actually correct. Wow, wow. And what's the last one? Ha, good. 
Now, the verb, rawaha, it means to leave or depart in the evening. Okay? To leave or depart in the evening. Now, you guys know some words from this. Okay? For example, rawaha, the second form of the verb, means to rest. And that's where tarawih comes from. Tarawih is the plural for resting. And I'll explain that in a second. You also have the words rih. What's rih? Wind. And the last one, if you just combine these, you get ruh. Soul. <laughs> Doesn't your soul leave your body every time you sleep? You come back. You wake up, Allah puts it in you. And for some, He doesn't. Right? Now look at all these meanings coming together for tarawih. They're all related. Now, tarawih is the plural for resting. What's a rest in Arabic? For those who know. If I say I'm taking a rest. Raha. Raha is a rest. So tarawih is resting. Now I have a question for you. Do any of you, when you're praying tarawih, do you take a rest? No, I'm praying tarawih. So why is it called that? So this is... Technically, you do take a rest because like the imams are reading for a really long time so then you go to sujood. Yeah. <laughs> like, they said when the imam is reading for a long time, you take a rest because you're just like listening to him. And then finally you wake up when it's time to go into ruku'ah. I like that. It actually comes from the meaning that tarawih has resting in between the sections of the prayer. So you pray four and then you take a rest. Then you pray another four and you take a rest. That's why in the Maliki Madhab, what, anyone know the number of rak'ahs in the Maliki Madhab? What's the normal number of rak'ah for, for tarawih? Not eight, 20. That's all the Madhab say 20. The Malikis though, their tarawih is 36. Let me tell you why. You have four from the Imam. Then your rest is to pray four on your own. So you take a rest from the Imam. Right? So if you have five sets of four, 20, and four breaks in between, that gives you how many rakah? 36. And the rest is supposed to be however long it takes you to pray those four on your own. That's the Maliki, not, it's not the dominant one, but that's where they get 36 from, if you've ever have heard 36. So if you're praying 20, say Alhamdulillah. I'm only praying 20. So what if like suhoor time comes in between? If suhoor time comes in between, then you gotta stop. Because then the Fajr time's in. Okay, now, in Tarawih, okay, actually before I show you this, let me double check something. Oh, okay, I was just gonna show you here that you can say, that should not be ta, that should be, yeah, actually that's fine. Tarwihatun nafs means to take a walk or a stroll. Okay? And then you can say tarwih is fanning or ventilation or refreshment. All that in the same meaning of the word tarawih. <laughs> All I know is that whenever I pray tarawih, not here at Adams, but normally it's really hot and I'm like a bunch of men standing next to me and they're all just standing there. It's not really cool and ventilating, right? But the idea is that Tarawih is supposed to provide you the kind of, you know, breeze of Ramadan, that you're really feeling it when you're standing in Tarawih. And that's the major jump that we make from our normal ibadat, is that we end up praying Tarawih. Okay, now what happens at the end of Tarawih in the month of Ramadan? What's the objective a lot of times at the end of Ramadan in Tarawih prayers? What do you do? What does the Imam do? Sorry, I can't hear too well. I hear little bits of it. What happens? What is, what is the goal in Tarawih prayers at the end of Ramadan? Finish the Quran. What's that in Arabic? A khatam or khatmul Quran. Right? So now let's look at the word khatam. What's the, what's the first letter? Kha. What's the Ain letter? Ta. What's the last letter? Me. That one was simple because it's got only three. Okay? Now, what does that mean? Khatama. To do what? To? To finish. It means to seal or to imprint. 
Okay, it means to seal or to imprint, and we're closing now. Okay? So I need you to pay attention for this. What do you wear on your ring? Ah, oh, no, I just gave it away to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. What do you wear on your finger? A ring. And what's the word for ring in Arabic? Khatim. Good. Khatim. Now, if you look at a ring, so I have here a picture of Rasulullah's ring. Right? He would use it as a seal to seal envelopes. And there's actually, this is how crazy Arabic is. There's a verb which it means to wear a ring. Takhattama yatakhattamu means to wear a ring. Uh, all of that in that one word. SubhanAllah, okay, so that's a little tangent. Now, if I look at a ring, pretend I have a ring here. If I turn the ring, a ring looks like that, true? Now, if I have this ring, is there a beginning to that ring? No. And what happens when, you, when the Imam gets to the khatam, what does he do after he finishes? He starts, from the he starts again. He starts again. So the Qur'an has no beginning and no end. But what does it have? What does the ring have in the middle? A seal. No, no, over here. What's that? What's in the middle of a ring? Not empty, and I heard it. Someone said it. Now what? Not you, I mean, oh, maybe my finger, yeah, if it's on my finger, good. But I can only put my finger through the what? The hole, which is an opening. And that's what Fatiha is. The opening. Or Yani, the opener, I should say, because it's Mufa'il. Because, if I, let me give it to you like this. If I walk into a room, can I say necessarily I'm at the beginning of the room? No, you say I'm in the room. So after you read Fatiha, you're in it. <laughs> to win it, inshallah. You're in it, from, you're in the Quran. The Quran is not something that has its beginning or end like any other normal book. You read it over and over and over and over, and it gives you more meaning and more meaning and more meaning. So, this khatam, it's amazing that we call it that. Because there's other words for finish. Intaha, we stop. You know, there's so many other words you could use for to stop or to finish. <laughs> but in reality, you never finish. You never finish. And insha'Allah, if Allah grants you the ability to do so, you can do a khatm al-Qur'an in this month of Ramadan coming up. If you're a hafiz, I need you to do two. You got more work to do than other people. Okay? But insha'Allah, with just these few couple words, you can now really improve your understanding. And I was going to go through many words. Tahajjud. I mean, all kinds of words you could do. Right? But make it a point that this Ramadan, you will try to figure out what is being said. Whether it's through a... Seriously? Whether it's through a translation or you learn 30 new Arabic words in the month. One word a day. And figure out what it means. And then figure out how does that help me in my relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal. Then your Ramadan will be transformed. And inshallah Allah allows us to have a blessed Ramadan one in which we draw closer to him and one in which we truly, truly, truly increase in our love for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala if you have any questions, I apologize if I made any mistakes I typed this pretty quickly and the last thing I'll say as I go, because it's really cool is that, what's the word for knowledge in Arabic? Ilm, right? Ayn, Lam, and Meem what's the word for action? Amal so there's a science in Arabic, if you switch the letters, there's meaning in the switching. Ayn, Meem, and Lam is to do work. And then there's a word, if you switch again, Lam, Meem, Ayn. Ma ma'na lamia? Lama. To shine. So when you truly take your knowledge, and you truly implement it and do it, you can't just have one or the other. It's only through the combination that you will truly, inshallah ta'ala, shine with the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within your heart. Barakallahu feekum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu.